I wanted this flayed one to be bigger and not as frail looking as the official models. So I thought about basing them on immortals, but eventually I settled on Praetorians because the way their heads are sunk in a bit more into their chests just looked a bit more interesting. In the background, even though lesser Necrons are more likely, any Necron can fall to the flayed one curse. So I wanted to toy with that idea. When I showed the first draft of this guy on my Discord, people brought up that this reminded them a lot of the twice dead king normals, which is really what I wanted to go for thinking about what a Necronoble that fell to the curse could potentially look like. So this is Steve from the 3rd Regiment. Just ignore the metal thing um, hanging from his waist. Whenever I start a kit bash, I try to assemble the main elements and then do a bit of brainstorming, where I fiddle with the elements to find a pose and see what parts work together and which don't. And at this point, I also checked how the fleet one parts would fit with this body. I find this phase really important in any kit bash because often I will drop ideas I thought were really good for better ones because they didn't pass the reality check. I had this picture saved in my inspiration folder and it influenced a lot of the ideas that would go into this kit bash. The shoulders should direct the viewer more towards the skeleton on the back, making the gruesome story even more center part of the mini. And frame the head in a way that it almost disappears, leading to a grotesque situation where the human remains almost look like an elongated head on top of this abomination. And while we are on the topic of killer robots, let me thank this video's sponsor, Mech Arena. Mech Arena is a fast-paced, competitive 5 vs 5 shooter. You can choose between a ton of different mechs and an even greater number of unique weapon systems. Every game brings new situations and opportunities for clutch gameplay. <laughs> Pilots are another cool feature of Mech Arena. Maybe Nova can be your new in-game waifu, if that's your thing. She boosts the damage of missiles, which is my weapon of choice, and she lets me double down on the playstyle I enjoy. There's a lot of different pilots available though, each of them specializes in a particular weapon type, and you can stuff them full of implants that will further play into the strengths of your mechs or counterbalance their weaknesses. The game is free to play, although you'd wish it was pay to win when you encounter me on the battlefield. Thanks for the extra 15% damage, Nova. You can actually connect with me through this ID and we can play some games together. If you can handle the humiliation. humiliation. There's a lot of things happening in-game right now, like we just got the new clan feature, a free-for-all mode, and a new weapon system called the Nade Launcher. And there's always cool events with the chance to acquire limited edition skins and other new gear. Mech Arena is completely free to play on Android, iOS, and even PC, and you can use my link in the description to get a free starter pack worth $15 reduce, which includes an amateur crate, 300 A coins, and a pulse cannon 4 to help kickstart your Game. What are you waiting for? Use my link or scan the QR code on screen, grab your free goodies for a head start, and let's own some noobs. I wanted to fit a flayed one spine on the back, and that, as well as the rib cage, needed some space. So I started to hack away some of the elements. However, with sculpting, you always need something like an armature, a solid part you can press your clay on, so it doesn't wobble and move. And that's why I'm leaving some of these parts that would line up with the bulkier ridges on the back of the shoulders, so I could extend them forward. And as I'm pressing on clay, I try to find a design that would fit my idea, sloping the sides more and making everything wrap more around the area of the face. It's better to be patient here and wait for that initial draft to be hard so we are not smooshing everything flat again with the next layer. And again, the first layer acts as a foundation for a final, more detailed layer. At this point, I'm smoothing out areas with this larger color shape on the fly. And at the same time, I try to push the rich parts into shape. It's okay though if not everything has super sharp angles at this point because I'll sand all the parts smooth when everything is cured. And you definitely need a bit of patience here not to go too fast and screw things up. The old skeleton warrior box is a good resource for skeleton parts like arms and chests and I'm kind of sad to see it go away with the new release. I should have bought at least one extra box before it got discontinued. I only attached the ribcage at this point because I wanted to see the bigger picture before attaching the arms. In the artwork that inspired me, you can see another figure in the back where one of the victims still has its helmet on and I wanted to copy that. I clipped out a skull with a dislocated jaw from the Games Workshop skull sprues and used one of the new Cadian helmets that I cut down and milled out so it would be flexible with how I can put it on the skull. Again, I checked how everything would fit together and tried to find a position I liked before gluing everything together. I don't know why, but using separate elements, reworking them and putting them together with a new purpose is just really, really satisfying. And I need to do it more. With these main elements established, 
I can now smooth out everything and finalize the angles. At this point, I had to think about the final pose and for that, I needed the base to be finished. Epic Basing just released their Battlefield Bones and Skull Collector packs that were a perfect fit for the theme. I figured this guy would scavenge the killing fields after a more or less recent battle and search for some human loincloth that would make his complexion look a lot healthier. And not sure why, but this whole skinning people thing gave me a lot of macabre ideas. And looking at one of these loose skeleton jaws on the basing element, I took one of the new Kiria heads and cut it in shape so it would fit right on top of this jaw. So I cut away the lower jaw, I kept the upper lip and some of the cheeks so the two parts would fit together perfectly. I had to make some room and cut away one of the resin skulls and then glued the head onto the jaw. I just had to sculpt a little bit of skin overhanging to cover the gap between the two parts. To build the base I took some epoxy clay and mushed it flat on a plastic base. Now, using some broken concrete and more skull parts by Epic Basing, I slowly cobbled together a scene and dry fitted the mini occasionally. This video is not sponsored by Epic Basing, but they kindly gave me a 10% discount voucher that you can find in the description. It's going to last until the end of February if you want to get any of their STLs or some resin bits for your own bases. Like these skull and bone sets or sandbags, crates and so on. Go check them out. Their stuff really helped me level up my basing game and they're good creative people who I think deserve the shout out. I also slapped on one of these monoliths that worked pretty nicely with the Necron theme. Added more skulls and bones, a hand sculpted rock here and there to tie everything together and then added some grout in the recesses. With the base done, I could finally add the head because now I knew the direction the Necron was walking in, which would dictate where the face should look. Before adding the skin, I made sure I had the arms of the skeleton in place because I knew I would also cover them partially with it. I started by covering the face and we will talk about my approach for these skin parts in a bit. Here I just slapped together tiny bits of clay so I wouldn't accidentally cover too much in one go. For example, I wanted both eyes to still be very visible as well as most of the teeth. Because I wanted them looking out from under the flesh mask in a menacing way. Just like with painting, it's always good to add some extra details to large flat areas. And that's why I sculpted a little cut just above the eye area and added some extra definition where the skin stretches over the cheeks. I felt like if you take the skin off of a head, it's only natural you could not quite do that without hair still attached to it. And I thought it would add a bit of goofiness if I gave this Necron a haircut. First I added enough clay so I had some volume to work with and then structured bigger strands of hair and eventually added a little bit of extra detail. I have a full video tutorial about how to sculpt hair and fur on my Patreon and in the YouTube members section if you're interested in learning more. I wanted to add an explanation for why the arm of the skeleton stays in place the way it is, so I covered the end with a bit of skin, adding enough clay so I then could place a spike into it, making it look like the arm got impaled on it. I got the spikes from one of the arms that I tried to fit into the kit bash, but ultimately decided it would be a bit over the top. That's why I shortened the claws on one of the arms, then cutting them into shape and scraping and sanding them more flat and delicate. Now let's talk about the two approaches I used for doing the skin. The first one is to apply all the outlines of the area that would be covered, working on the edges a bit so it had a more credible structure and so it looked like actual tissue stretching over the metal. And then filling in the rest. This way I have a lot more control over how thick the layer will be in the end and I don't have a lot of excess material I have to cut away. The second approach is to take pre-cut sheets and attaching them to the mini. This is particularly useful when you want to create parts that float in the wind or to show movement and anything that overhangs the edges of the mini. I'm using an old glass cover from a picture frame for this where I put down a lot of water and a portion of my epoxy clay. I usually let the clay cure a few minutes so it doesn't dissolve too much in the water and it also doesn't rip as easily. With this technique, you need to make sure that at least your overhang is already detailed the way you want it because it's not that easy to press the tool against some uncured, free floating clay without mushing it or pushing it into weird shapes. Also personally, I tend to make these sheets too big as you can see and then I have to correct a lot. It's no big deal, but just something to keep in mind if you want to save some time. 
I'm using all kinds of different tools to cut the sheet down, smooth it out, and add some structure and texture to it until I'm happy with the result. I've prepared a couple of these small rolls of clay that resemble small spikes. And once they were cured, I cut them in half so I could press them into fresh sheets of clay here and there so it looked like they were helping to hold the skin in place. Uh, just like that bigger spike I showed you earlier from a plastic talon. Moving between the two approaches, I covered more and more area with skin. And I also dragged some parts up into the skeleton, which almost makes it look like they're holding Steve in place there. And I'm trying not to just slap some flat sheets of clay on. I'm fraying the edges and I'm creating some wrinkles and folds and parts that stretch more than others so the flat surfaces wouldn't look too boring later during the painting. I went ahead and covered more and more parts with these sheets and put more detailing work in. And this is a good exercise in how some thin tissue would behave over hard surfaces and hard folds and creates crevices and so on. And whenever I was happy with the result, I swept over it with a damp brush as usual for some extra smoothness. I added some lost details, like a few more of these spikes, and then attached the second arm to finish out the dramatic pose. So let's get this bad boy painted up. I first applied a layer of dark aluminium over a black base coat and then mixed burnt umber ink with contrast medium to stain the armor. Similar to what I did in my 9th edition Necrons video. I also mixed contrast medium with some black and abyssal turquoise to add a shade of blue to the metallics as well. This gives some nice variety and a good base to work off of. I gave all the skin parts an opaque layer of elf skin tone and then added washes of red oxide. The goal was to create a feeling of fresh skin. I didn't think too much about realism though, I just went with rule of cool and I just liked the saturation that red oxide gave. I tidied the skin parts up with elf skin tone and then gradually added more and more wolf gray to place additional highlights. The blue takes the saturation out of the highlights, which contrasts nicely against the saturated shade areas. I wanted Steve's remains to look older and like they were stuck to the back of our flayed one for a while now. So I started with a layer of dark brown over black and gradually worked the highlights up through the various earth and khaki tones, using stippling to create more textured gradients. I quickly treated the hair to a couple of highlights over a blue and black base mix. And then went back to the metallics and Steve's helmet for a while, adding rust washes for some color variety. I wanted the helmet to look really old and worn out and I just wanted to try something different. So I washed some green tones over the dark metal color I had on the helmet left from airbrushing the metallics. Then I treated the rest of the metallics to some highlights and also stippled on additional metal where paint would have flaked off on the helmet, like on the edges and the more exposed parts. I also brought back some highlights on the claws, mainly on the very edges, but also made sure there were some reflections on the blade parts. And then also brought back some more shine to the rest of the armor.
I wanted to try the new Game Color FX paints, so I created an inhomogeneous mix of the two blood products they created, and then used the splayed brush to create spilled blood and blood splatter in some strategic areas. I usually give my neck currents this glow from within in various colors, and I think I have it dialed in for this orange variant by now. Starting from a white base coat on the parts I want to glow. Then I airbrushed on a layer of Imperial Fist contrast paint. The funny thing is, you could probably stop at any of these stages and it would look really good. But I followed the yellow up with a few layers of thin down fluorescent orange. Finally, I added a mix of white and imperial fist towards the center that I wanted a lot brighter to make it look like the light is more intense there. I said at the beginning that I wanted the eyes to menacingly glow out from under the flesh mask, so I also gave them the same treatment, applying a layer of imperial fists over the white eyeballs. And then I added a few washes of the fluorescent paint. And I also followed this up with the last highlight of the yellow mix. And this is the result. I kind of like how the skin stands out against the darker parts of the armor. I guess if I wanted to spend more time on this, the way to go would be to add more variety on the skin color, making some parts look older and less bright. But overall, I'm happy with how this turned out. And I think I particularly like the more menacing pose and the over the top OSL that maybe could be attributed to the virus taking over. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you are looking for more Necron videos, you can check out any of these two on screen offering two distinctly awesome offering two distinctly awesome painting approaches necrons are fun what can i say necrons are fun what can i say